students in this class we will continue what we talked about in previous class which is microbial symbiosis but our interest now will be on the uh, higher order of life forms particularly and specifically mammals we will start with ruminant my, um, mammals and then we'll move on to human beings so let's get started here now in the um, in the figure on the left you have four plots and if you note here on the first plot of the um, this particular plate you have um, as the different food types are present on the x axis and the proportion refractory so the proportion that's really hard to digest is increases or is different for the different kinds of food types so for example the food on the right most have higher amount of refractory in them than the uh, food types present in the, on the left side of the um, x axis so if we look at different kinds of uh, organisms and how much how well and how efficiently they can degrade the two different kinds of foods the one here which have very low or negligible amount of refractory uh, food uh, pr uh, proportion and the ones that are very high in the refractory uh, portion of the um, food so if you look at fish and lizard we notice that um, they can digest very well the food here which is which has very low refractory, uh, refractory proportion but their efficiency drops uh, by up to 60 percent for fish when the refractory portion rises up similarly for arthropods we notice a quite linear decrease as the um, portion of refractory or difficult to digest part of the food increases again in birds and mammals that are non-ruminant like ourselves we notice that high fiber food or food that's hard to digest will reduce the efficiency of digestion and this is where the stomach of ruminant organ um, ruminant living beings such as cows and rabbits really helps them digest their food better especially when it has high uh, concentration or higher proportion of refractory materials now what would be your typical refractory materials in food obviously cellulose and maybe some amount of lignin or hemicellulose now this is very relevant when we talk about uh, beings such as termites which feed on wood or rabbits which feed mostly on grass and on different kinds of leaves also with herbivores such as cows and buffaloes now they have evolved to have a special kind of stomach which we just abbreviate and we call it rumen and now we are going to notice uh, today in this class we are going to study how the microbial composition of the rumen affects the or encourages or allows the degradation of cellulose and other complex organics that are otherwise very hard to digest for example if we humans who are non-ruminant mammals eat grass we won't get we'll hardly get any calories out of it now depending on the grass it might have some sugars and we'll take benefit of that sugar but we will not be able to digest the fibers or cellulose same is the case with dogs but when it comes to ruminant uh, beings they can make energy out of it so let's look at the rumen of a cow and try to get an understanding of how a rumen works in general so this is your esophagus so esophagus is your basically the food pipe through which the food travels in so now the cow has eaten some grass and it will go through the esophagus into the rumen reticulum chamber so this big chamber here is rumen reticulum chamber now it goes in the rumen reticulum chamber to stay here it will ruminate for a while which means there'll be some kind of degradation happening here and then it will be vomited by back to the mouth where the cow or buffalo will chew the cud so they will chew it again send it back again and then this process will continue the process of food coming in from mouth to rumen reticulum chamber and then going back to the mouth uh, until the food is small enough for it to pass into the omasum, abasum, uh, um, omasum and abasum uh, portions of the stomach. Now, uh, now this, these ports are usually much, much smaller than what is depicted here for in the schematic. But the point is that every time the food ruminates in the rumen and is chewed again by the cow, buffalo or the ruminant mammal, there is some level of degradation that happens apart from the mechanical chewing done by the cow. And this degradation is carried out mostly by enzymatic action of microbes and to some degree enzymatic action of enzymes released by the mammal itself. Now once the food is, has been chewed to smaller levels enough, plenty of degradation has happened, 
then um, the food will pass into omasum and abamasum and it will go into the small intestine. So this is your small intestine tract. Okay, so if we look at this cartoon of uh, the digestive tract of ruminant mammal, we notice that uh, they have a foregut fermentation chamber, then they have an acidic stomach which very much like our acidic stomach. They have a small intestine followed that follows acidic stomach again very much like our uh, digestive system. And then in their uh, hindgut or in where we have large intestine, they have something called cecum which is their hindgut fermentation chamber. Some fermentation also happens in the colon and then the excretion of the waste. So they have basically two fermentation chamber. One is the foregut fermentation chamber, the other is hindgut fermentation chamber. So the big um, refractory components of food that were degraded and chewed up to small enough quantities in the rumen now will either ferment in the foregut fermentation chamber or in hindgut fermentation chamber. Now we have two types of ruminants. One are the foregut fermentator, fermenters which ferment mostly in their foregut and then there are hindgut fermentators which ferment mostly in their hind. Now the examples of foregut would be the most ruminants, monkeys, sloth, marsupials such as kangaroo, hudzin. The, um, in hindgut fermenters, we have again two different kinds of hindgut fermenters, one that will ferment in the cecum and the other in the column. So in the colon, so the cecal fermenters would be rabbits, hares, some rodents such as rats, grouse and some reptiles. The colon ferments would be equids, or some rodents, humans like ourselves and reptiles. So for foregut fermenters, the their foregut is microbial because that is where they are fermenting. So the microbes here, after they have fermented the food, what they will do is they will uptake the daughter products or during the fermentation they will take the daughter products and there is lot of microbes that are now produced because this is nutrient rich, so microbial growth is exponential they, and they have lot of um, the microbial growth increases very high concentration of microbial proportion. Now when the food, the fermented food goes to the acidic stomach, it does not go alone, it carries some biomass with it. So when the biomass comes here in the acidic stomach, the biomass gets, gets acid hydrolyzed and thus the cow or the animal not only gets food from the food that it ate, the grass or whatever it ate, but also benefits, also has the additional benefit of eating the microbial biomass that grew up on in, uh, upon the fermentation daughter products that happen, of the fermentation that happened in the foregut chamber. This advantage is not present with hindgut fermenters like ourselves. For us hindgut fermenters, we do not have that advantage. For us, the food does not pass through a foregut fermentation chamber, many of us, most of us do not have one. Food directly goes to the acidic stomach, undergoes initial degradation and then undergoes cecal fermentation or colon fermentation. Now, all the biomass that is produced here in the cecum or in the colon is excreted out directly. And that is one reason why our fecal matter is so rich in uh, microbes. Now think about this, if the human body or other uh, hindgut fermenters could actually capitalize the biomass in the poop, <coughs> then we would require much less food. This advantage is only present for foregut fermenters, not for the hindgut fermenters. So in this particular study, there whose picture is there on the right side of the slide, what they did was they added urea or ammonium chloride with Iso isotope of heavier isotope of nitrogen. So these were high heavier urea or heavier ammonium chloride. This is a stable isotope probing, a technique in which I add a, a heavier isotope of the either carbon, nitrogen or any other element that I know will be uptaken by biomass. And then as it goes through different parts of the digestive system, I can look at radioactivity and I can get an idea of uh, where then this nitrogen is being removed. So we notice that in foregut fermenters, when the uh, labeled nitrogen urea or labeled um, ammonium chloride and labeled nitrogen source was added, it was fermented here. So there was a lot of um, labeled nitrogen that was detected here. And then in acidic stomach again it was detected and then it was assimilated in the small intestine and it became part of the cow, became part of the foregut fermenter and there was hardly any uh, hardly any uh, heavier nitrogen observed in the poop. 
In Heingart fermenter, there will be a different situation. In Heingart fermenter, because there is no, because there is no foregut fermentation, we will notice and when the fermentation happens in the Heingart, either in cecum, cecum or in colon, we notice that a lot of um, the nitrogen that has been degraded becomes part of biomass, is not adsorbed, is not absorbed by the body and is released in the excreta. Now, look at the what happens in the rumen where lot of fermentation happens for ruminants, the foregut fermenters. Usually we have the feed which is hay, grass or other things, they have the very rich in cellulose, in starch and sugar. So, we, they undergo cellulosis, amylosis. So, they break down into simpler sugars in the rumen. So, this is all bacterial degradation. So, here we are talking about our foregut fermenters which are our ruminants. So, if you remember this rumen, this is your foregut fermentation chamber. So, it under, uh, breaks down into sugar, then into pyruvate, lactate and then uh, will go to the ruminant bloodstream or its sugar can directly go to the ruminant bloodstream depending on the kind of sugar. It, can un it will undergo fermentation and form formate or methane or carbon dioxide or acetate. If it is acetate or propionate that will go inside the bloodstream and if it is uh, carbon dioxide or methane, the cow will excrete it out. So, this is called eructation. And then this is the overall stoichiometry of your rumen fermentation. Now the microbes that um, that inhabit and they that cattle that uh, that in in a way carry out these chemical reactions are very diverse, as is very clear by the panel on the right, where you notice that the um, each of these dendrogram is one kind of microbe that has been detected using the third generation sequencing technique. We will call them metagenomics because we did not require to culture them. We notice that there are a lot of clostridia that are present in the rumen, in the rumen of a cow and that is why we initially believe that most of the cellulose degraders are present in clostridia or in firmicutes which is still, a, um, which is still relevant because most of the cellulose degrading organisms or the one that carry out the hydrolysis of cellulose that we know are present in firmicutes. So, we have Fermicutes, Bacilli, Lactobacilli, Negativity Cutes, Clostridia, Ruminococcia, all of them are um, Fermicutes. And then we had other kind of Fermicutes and some Actinobacteria, Proteobacteria, some Proteobacteria, Spirochetes, Tenericutes, some Bacteroidetes, some Bacteria. And so, this is the very diverse and yet um, very localized microbial community of um, rumen. Now, now, important thing is, okay, this is the rumen microbiology already, how does it affect the health of the animal? Now, here is the thing, if there is any rapid change in the rumen microbiology that can affect the health of the animal. For example, if instead of feeding the cow hay or cellulose rich uh, food, I start feeding them grain rich food, now the grains they have red uh, they have very different chemical composition than cellulose rich hay. The sugars are easily available, the protein content is different, sugar content is different and more importantly they have very high starch content. Now because of this very high starch content what happens is that uh, Streptococcus bovis grows rapidly in rumen. In fact, it is almost like a Streptococcus bovis outbreak in the rumen. It colonizes and becomes a dominant member of the rumen and it starts degrading starch and then it results in acidiosis, acidic environment in rumen which irritates the rumen may even lead to internal hemorrhage and kill the cow, kill the ruminant animal. So, note what we eat will affect the microbial community, will affect the daughter products and that will affect the health of the cow or the animal. So, this is the first glimpse that we have here of how the, our food affects the microbial community in the gut. This is the gut of the uh, cow, the foregut fermentation chamber and that affects the health. So, now if we look at uh, other microbes, other beings that have hindgut fermentation or just simple digestive system, we can divide them into, uh, now, um, now we are talking about food, how food affects our, um, our microbial community in the fermentation chamber and our health. So, if we look at different kinds of animals which eat different kinds of food, for example, we will have herbivores, carnivores and omnivores. 
Now, um, the omnivores typically tend to have, uh, they come, they tend to come in the type 4 of uh, kind of um, gut microbial communities, which is typical with omnivores and frugivores, the ones that eat fruits. Carnivores have a very different microbial community. Omnivores and folivores have very different community. Now again among herbivores we have two different either hindgut or foregut. Now within hindgut and foregut we will have two which are remember that whether the degradation is happening in the cecal fermentation chamber or in the colon that will affect the kind of microbial community. So if we look at the mammals and we look at their microbial community in the digestive tract, we notice at least five distinct types and all depend upon the kind of food they are eating whether they are dog, hyena or lion, if they are carnivore, carnivorous diet, they will all have similar microbial community. And among the herbivores, we have foregut fermenters and hindgut fermenters, their microbial communities are different. And among the hindgut community members also, we have two different classes of communi microbial community. Now, uh, now again, this is a very nice study where they looked at different kinds of uh, guts of different organisms. and and not just gut, but also, for example, human mouth, human skin, human vulva. And they notice that how the microbial communities are different and are similar. So very nice study. I'll make this slide available. So take, take a good look and try to understand what kind of information we can generate from the, um, from the next generation sequencing tool. On the right panel is an equally interesting uh, plot from a recent study where you notice how microbial diversity varies from different kind of environments. So this is a vertebrate gut and it is mostly dominated by firmicutes. And then there are some bacteroidetes, right? And then this is the human, other human samples. We have considerable amount of firmicutes and some amount of bacteroidetes and other microbes. Now soil and sediment have very diverse microbial communities compared to human gut and human um, microbiome and compared to the vertebrate gut. And so we and also termite gut because there is lot of uh, cellulose degradation happening in termite gut. It also has plenty of firmicutes, some bacteriorities and other microorganisms. Now um, the thing to notice that the, if we notice this is the proportion for human lot of let us say this is human the first blue is the human gut. Then we have lot of clostridium hardly any bacteriorities and other microbes. Now this is not does not mean that every human will have similar microbial community structure. In fact, what we know is that microbial community structure varies from one human to another. And that brings me to here. If you talk about human microbiome, not only does the amount of human uh, microbial community present in different parts of our digestive system vary, but also the composition varies from one person to another. In fact, the recent studies in human microbiome and the internal environment of human um, system it shows that depending on how our microbial community changes within will impact our health and our well-being. For example, now we know that the healthy, uh, the micro, the gut microbial community of a healthy individual is distinct from the gut microbial community of an obese individual. And we will talk about how it is distinct and how much it is distinct. So the human gut can, the human digestive system can be broadly classified into or at least where the most of digestion is happening, stomach, duodenum, uh, ileum, jejunum and column. In stomach the pH is around 2 and we have less than 10 to power 4 microbes per gram of digestive pulp. So if we take a pulp from stomach, we will have less than 10 to power 4 cells per gram of the digestive pulp. Then the next step would be the food entering the jejunum. In jejunum, the pH is between um, around 4 and we will have anywhere from 10 to power 3 to 10 to power 4 microbial cells per gram of the pulp. Now if we go to ileum, ileum the pH rises to 5 and we will have anywhere from 10 to power 8, around 10 to power 8 cells per gram of the digestive pulp. And now if we go to our uh, colon or our large intestines, we will have very high number of microbes ranging from 10 to power 11 to 10 to power 4 cells per gram. So we can see that where the fermentation is happening, we are the cullen fermenter, hindgut fermenters. We will have lot of microbes present compared to stomach and other places. Now this is very important not only how many microbes are present, but who is present. For example, if helicobacter pylori is present in stomach, it can cause some severe hyperacidity and, and it survives very well at stomach pH by the way. And it can also cause uh, um, the ulcers, the acidic ulcers, which are very painful. 
we also know that it has this particular microbe H. pylori has very high co correlation with stomach cancer. So, this is one instance where we know that presence or absence of a particular microbe if it is just lying normally in with very less uh, in very less number it will not affect a lot. But if it colonizes a lot we will have acidity, peptic ulcers and even stomach cancer. So now um, most of the studies for human digestive system are not carried on humans but they are carried on poor mice. Now we know this thing that um, we looked at microbial community in the gut of mice and we now found out that the microbes they support digestion because they help in fermentation, they carry out fermentation, they support the epithelial homeostasis in gut, so the epithelium system and how it remains in homeostasis. They protect us against pathogens because if you have a rich and diverse community present in your gut and, a, in, and there is an intruding pathogen in your gut, then it, there is very high chances that the, in the native microbial community in your gut will outcompete the pathogen you will not have an infection. However, if you are eating antibiotics or for some reason because of some discrepancy in diet or other environmental stressors, the microbial community has become weak, diversity has lost, has been lost and the members that are abundant are not really very robust, then a pathogen has a higher chances of colonizing your intestine and outcompeting other microbes. So our gut microbes actually protect us pathogens against pathogens and they help us develop better immune system also. There is more study, we will talk about it if not in this lecture, in the next lecture which shows how the gut microbiota actually influences our mood and our well-being. So now we looked at fat mice and thin mice and we found out that the fat mice, the obese mice, so they both were fed similar diet, same diet, they were given same amount of exercise but some of them became really fat, obese, some of them were healthy, lean. So, we noticed that the microbial community in the fat guy, uh, mice was very rich in firmicutes and not so much in bacterial disease. The lean mice had slightly more proportion of bacterial disease, in fact twice as much. So, we then this is when people started suspecting that obesity perhaps has lot to do with our microbial community structure in the gut. So, people did other kind of studies where they fed low fat high fiber diet which is typically associated with lean biomass. So, low fat high fiber diet will result in lean biomass typically. So in this particular figure the dark mice here has microbes that, ob that promote obesity, the light mice has microbes that do not promote obesity. So when microbes were taken from the poop and this is by the way fecal transplant. where the fecal matter from a particular animal is transplanted into the uh, gut of the other animal. When this particular transplant was done from a, um, uh, from a rat that had microbes which promote obesity that is high firmicutes, less bacterial disease into a, uh, into a rat that had microbes that promote leanness that is more bacterial disease and the f diet was promoting leanness then there was the microbes the microbes stayed pro leanness and the rat stayed lean. So we notice that if diet is pro lean and the microbial community is also pro lean then the rat was lean. In other case we took a rat and um, that um, we took a rat that has microbes which are pro lean so the right the, the pro lean as in now when I say proline, I am talking about microbes that microbial community that is rich in bacterial disease, which we know is typical of lean mouse and we put it in a uh, put this transplanted this microbial community in a rat that was going to get obese because it had microbes that are pro obesity. We noticed that it did not become obese. So if diet is uh, pro um, leanness but the micro but the rat has a tendency to become fat to become obese and if it is not if it is not given any transplant then it will become fat but if it is given transplant if microbes that promote leanness are injected in it then it becomes lean very good now in other case we notice that uh, if we feed a high fat high fat low fiber diet which results more often than not into obesity and we um, did not we did not do the transplant from a microbial community of a lean um, um, microbial community of a lean rat into the fat 
rat or the microbial community that encouraged fatness, then the rat became obese. On the other hand, when we did do the transplant, when we took microbial community that promoted leanness and transplanted into rat that had microbial community that promoted obesity, it did not become obese. So, this was a very nice um, practice of if you remember Koch postulates that we talked in first few lectures and with this and this was more uh, detailed than what is represented in the schematic, people actually proved, scientists proved that um, microbial community and diet both have very important uh, impact. In fact, microbial community may have slightly more benefit and impact on the biomass of the rat. Now, the similar experiments are being done in human beings. We take two twins, so the twins have everything same, but one of them is obese, another is twin, uh, another is lean. So, if we take microbes from, we know that the microbes in the obese twin are different from microbes in the lean twin and we have done this using next generation sequencing tools, uh, techniques on 16S rRNA gene. And when we take the microbial community from the obese twin and put it in a healthy recipient rat and we feed it, feed it low fat high fiber diet. So, the diet is pro leanness. The diet wants you to become lean, but the microbial community has come from a fat person and sooner or later you become, you have increased adiposity and the rat becomes fat. On the other hand, when we took uh, microbes from a lean twin and put it in a mouse that um, and put it in a mouse that was fed the same diet, we noticed that the mouse remained lean and healthy. So, even in human beings, we are noticing that our microbial community will decide our body mass index. Now, um, in fact, recently in Japan, there was a study where they compared the gut microbial community of obese and lean people using 16S rRNA gene sequencing in Japanese population. And they found out now that, the, that they found out that um, the bacterial disease in lean population is slightly more than in obese population, not a lot, not, uh, not a very dramatic difference, but a slight difference. There is a difference, definitely significant difference in the concentrate levels, relative levels of firmicutes between lean and obese. The important part is that the microbial community of obese Japanese uh, st uh, volunteers in for the study was very different compared to the lean, mem uh, lean microbial community in lean members, again signifying that the microbial community varies and when it varies, the health of the body will vary too. And then this is not just related to um, obesity or body mass index, but it also has to do with other, other diseases such as the typical being the irritable bowel syndrome. So, initially people were concerned why some patients are having such irritable bowel and are so sick and is this a pathogen. When they were trying to identify the pathogen, they found out that though they cannot delineate any particular pathogen, the microbial community structure in the excreta of patients suffering from IBS is very different from the healthy population. And then they found out that the way um, whether it because of the stressors which may be changed in food or change in microbes or other drugs, when the microbial community in the gut changed a lot, then the um, irritable bowel syndrome set in depending on who is being promoted. Now, not only the microbial community changed, but also the gene um, functional genes changed. So, the kind of processes whether it is methanogenesis, fermentation or whatever is happening in the large uh, intestine uh, in small intestine changed for patients with IBS and healthy people. And that is one of the hope of treatment for IBS patients which is fecal transplant. So, either we can identify what were the triggers, what were the stresses that changed the healthy microbial community into unhealthy IBS prone microbial community and if there is a way to shift it back to healthy microbial community or we can actually take fecal matter from a fecal microbial community from a healthy individual and transplant it into an, a sick patient and then improve their, improve their health. The other part where this uh, other uh, avenue of research where research is being carried out on how our internal environment and microbial colonization of our internal environment affects our health and well-being is how it actually affects our brain. Now, we know that there is a brain gut axis and there are lot of neurons after the number of density of neurons in the brain, the highest density of neuron would be in the small intestine and large intestine. 
So, this is called the second brain now, our gut is our second brain. Now, depending on what kind of um, here, depending on what kind of microbes are colonized here, depending on what kind of um, re chemical reactions are happening here, what kind of um, transmitters are being produced here, um, the, the, the messages transmitted from gut to brain change and that changes the mood. So, we have well established that there is a very strong interplay between our digestive tract and our central nervous system. So, the stomach will inform the gut, brain on how things are, should we be happy or not and then the brain will inform the stomach, okay, we are under stress or we are happy or not. And that is the reason why under stress some people will have diarrhea and why uh, people after they are fed they feel very happy or when they are not fed they feel crappy. So, we have scientific evidence for this and in fact this is now being used for uh, treating diseases, uh, med medical, psychological diseases and also it is used for uh, training the mind to improve the health of the digestive tract. So, dear students, this is all for today. In next class, we will move on and we will look at other public health challenges that are linked very closely to microbiology, not in sense of pathogenic microbiology, but environmental microbiology and we will foray into antimicrobial resistance. Thank you very much.